Okay. So you got hold of him. Okay. All right. So uh, let's open this uh, calc file. <laughs> क्या हुआ हाँ इनके यहाँ कुछ प्रॉब्लम है ये लंच के बाद ना एक बार इनको भेज देना ऑल द स्टफ इज गेटिंग रिकॉर्डेड ओके सो ओके गाइस प्लीज लेट्स Okay, so all this stuff is in your notes, so you don't need to write anything. You have access to all of this material. Okay, so let's now uh, try to understand decision problems. Uh, okay, so does everyone now understand what a decision problem is? Okay, everywhere you need to take a decision is a decision problem, right? What should I do with my excess funds? That's also a decision problem. And then you can disaggregate that decision problem into multiple levels. First, you decide that okay, you're just going to put it. Uh, you're not. You're just going to keep it in your bank account, okay, uh, in your savings account. Or you decide you want to put it into some longer-term investment, okay. Then what type of investment should you have? So we are focused as managers. We are focused on decision problems. So you have this note in your folder, okay. You don't need to write any of this stuff down. Okay, let's just go through decision problems so that we can understand. We have a better context to have the valuation discussion. Okay, so whole uh, discussion on valuation is actually ought to be logically connected to decision problems. Okay, so uh, where do we? Uh, let's have this uh, since I've not really prepared for this kind of discussion at this stage, but we can go through this. Okay, so let's understand now. We're not going to worry about the uh, the decision problems that we're going to cover now. Actually, are very common as I've been saying. Most of the stuff that we are covering. is common to both management of investment funds investment portfolios okay which is the major type of problem but it is also a set of decision problems that is shared almost 100% by people who are managing corporate treasury uh, you know corporate balance sheets risk on a corporate balance sheet right like air india has a, a problem air india might have loans in foreign currencies they are worried about exchange rate appreciation they might have floating interest rate loans they might therefore they have interest rate risk they are also exposed uh, you don't see directly on the balance sheet but they have uh, exposure to jet fuel because crude oil prices will affect jet jet fuel prices which is around 50% of a balance sheet a uh, 50% of a typical airline's operating expenses so it's a big risk so all these risks exist on corporate balance sheet as well on a corporate uh, in a corporate treasury as well and the problems that we are discussing are actually almost 100% identical in both cases there are some small differences okay some of the problems the problems are identical but they are automatically solved in in one of the cases okay in some of these problems but okay so now this problem is a little bit hard for you to understand this discussion before we go into the discussion on asset classes so everything is interconnected so i always have a problem of sequencing things see before i wanted to get before getting into the discussion on valuation i wanted to uh, discuss the decision problems because valuation is actually connected to one of the decision problems the dis valuation in most of the finance textbooks you see that valuation is something that's just dropped from the sky that now we are going to discuss valuation did you have that feeling that sometimes you see that the discussion on value okay we have valuation but, but why do we need valuation okay so this question is uh, so it's actually connected to a decision problem so i wanted to bring in the decision problem now one of the, now three of the first three decision problems to understand the first three decision problems you have to uh, understand what asset classes markets and instruments are okay so let's uh, go back a little bit and then we go back to uh, we have to therefore go back to your a uh, short version of the markets module are you following my logic yes sir okay so we have to do this markets first because we want to get you quickly to the asset classes markets and instruments so so far everybody has understood that we have defined a market as a venue for exchanging two assets yes so in any market we are looking at two assets okay all right and we have defined certain terms we call them base asset and terms asset okay 
just to quickly recap once again what is base asset and terms asset if you ever forget you can just work it out with a simple example that you're familiar with if you go to the market and you try to buy sugar okay what are you buying you'll be discussing okay what is the sugar price it might be 20 rupees a kilo it might be 40 rupees a kilo or 70 rupees a kilo okay but what is not changing is that one kilo of sugar that part is not changing what is changing is how many rupees you need to buy one kilo of sugar is that clear so this is something for which you don't need uh, I mean you can always recall this example okay if you ever get confused think of it in these terms and try to get your uh, your perspective back through this simple example but if you go to the market and buy a, uh, buy sugar then that's one kilo of sugar is not changing depending on what what the unit is okay so the point is in this case the base and think of the base as something that does not change okay so the base is something that does not change we can uh, have a look at some of these other prices as well just very quiet today because uh, the us is off for the fourth of july holiday okay so the base asset think of the base as something that does not change does that make sense a base is something that is fixed so it does not change so therefore this kind of example sugar is the base asset in the sugar market in india sugar is the base asset and what is the terms asset okay the terms asset is indian rupees we say the terms asset here is indian rupees because one unit of sugar in this case the unit happens to be kilo but you should think of it as in one unit of sugar because somewhere else maybe in a wholesale market in Ghazipur or somewhere they might be trading it in terms of a quintal or something like that so uh, so the price may be quoted in terms of a quintal but the point is it's always one unit okay here the unit is kilo and there the unit might be quintal okay so you have uh, uh, the base asset the one unit of the base asset that is being priced that does not change that is a base asset okay therefore it's a base asset and it's called the other one is called the terms asset because one unit of sugar is being priced in terms of Indian rupees okay you could have also chosen to price it in terms of Japanese yen or Canadian dollars but obviously here nobody is going to accept Japanese yen and Canadian dollars so if you're buying sugar in India most of the time you'll be trading in the local currency this is clear so it's being priced in terms of uh, the uh, local currency which is Indian rupee that's why it's called the terms asset this is clear if you're buying sugar yash is not convinced you're clear okay so why do we call it base asset and terms asset okay you have to remember the terms but then if you get confused as to which is which you can remember it in this way that the base doesn't change think of a simple local ex local market example and then the terms asset is because it's being priced in terms of the terms asset one unit of the base asset is being priced in terms of the terms asset okay if we have um, if we don't have it here okay um, Okay, I should just write a brief ex example. I'll just write it here and then I'll expand on it later. Okay. Base has the sense of being unchanging and terms is in terms of. Okay, so I'll, I'll expand this a little bit later after the class. So now everybody understands this? Yes. We have recapped this. Okay, so as uh, uh, Rajan was asking about the earlier part of the definition that I mean this exchange of two assets it's going to apply across the board for all markets okay all right so what I'm doing let me just give you a little bit of a background that this terminology strictly speaking does not exist in the market for all assets but we are extending it this terminology actually comes from the foreign exchange markets okay so in the foreign exchange markets we use this term like a base currency here for instance in, this is an example of the foreign exchange market dollar yen so in the foreign exchange markets we have this expression base currency or terms currency the terms currency is sometimes also called a quote currency so what i've done is i've treated a currency so what i've said here is currency is a species of asset remember contract remember, be very familiar with this kind of lingo okay you should be as management students should be very familiar with this kind of lingo remember we used to say contract is a species of agreement so which is the larger category agreement. agreement is the larger category okay so this is how we write it in English we say contract is a species of agreement if you want it to be more formal it doesn't sound very good in terms of the language you write it as contract is a species of the genus agreement but in normal uh, language we don't write it like that because it doesn't sound nice we just say contract is a species of agreement so the large the lower ca the smaller category comes first and then we say so similarly I'm saying currency is a species of asset okay 
So I've defined asset here as you can see in your earlier part of the notes that in economics and finance, uh, in uh, academic economics, they make a distinction between asset markets and goods markets. But I'm not going to make that distinction because I don't think it's very, um, it's a very useful distinction in the context of uh, the study of financial markets in the modern world. Okay, so we don't make this distinction. So everything is an asset. Okay, so currency is an asset, crude oil is an asset, shares of Tesla are an asset, bonds issued by IBM are an asset, everything is an asset. Okay, debt securities are assets, uh, equities are assets. Okay, in the classical finance definition, only debt and equity securities would be assets. Okay, and the others would be treated as goods. Okay, so but I'm not doing using that classification because I don't think it's the right way to approach the study of uh, finance in the modern world. Okay, so I'm calling everything assets. Okay, currencies, commodities, equities, debt, everything. Okay, is there, everyone's following so far? Okay, so uh, what did I say? Uh, so uh, is base asset. So, so the reason I borrowed this from the currency markets and I've extended it to the entire universe of assets is so because currency is a species of asset. Okay. So therefore, what the market terminology that we use in the currency markets, which is base currency and terms currency, we can just apply it across the board to all assets by using the more general term base asset and terms asset. Are you following my logic? Yes, everybody. Okay. All right. Okay. So. Uh, that's what we are doing. So I borrowed. If anybody asks you, you can say that it has been borrowed from the currency markets, where it's an established practice. Okay, to call it base currency and terms currency. Okay, All right. So uh, in every market, therefore, as an initial, so we will expand this list later on. But at this stage, in every market, you have to establish what is the base asset, and what is the terms asset, and what is the unit. Okay, when we are when we are looking at a market, you should try to identify these aspects. All right, so let's look at some of the currency markets. So if we look at currency markets as a starting point where we have from, from where we're borrowing this terminology, base asset, terms asset. So here we have uh, the convention in the currency markets is that the base asset will always be shown first. Okay, in the notation, the base asset is always shown first. So if we go back to Tanya's question about dollar yen, who is going to answer that? Sukriti, can you help her? What was Tanya's question about dollar yen? Remember, we were showing a dollar yen chart, and what was her question? We were showing, I think, a four hour chart. What was her question? Do you remember? Give her the mic, yes. Quickly, quickly pass the mic. We have to move very quickly, like a four by 100 relay team. Yes. What was her question on dollar yen? Do you remember? Okay, so something of that sort. So what she was asking is, when I look at this dollar yen chart, I'm not able to figure out whether it's one dollar equal, equal at this point, let's say 108, whether one dollar equals uh, 108 yen or one yen equals 108 dollars. Okay. So give based on this clue that I've given you, that the convention in the currency markets is that the base asset is always shown first. Now, can you answer the Tanya's question? Yes, sir. What is it? One by one, everybody is talking. Okay, let's uh, have uh, Jen answer. Give her the. Uh, yeah, yeah. Use the mic anyway, even though you're on the first bench. So, what is it? Sir, USD is the base currency and GDP by the Okay. So, what is this? One yen equal to one hundred eight dollars. What is this chart sh showing us? One yen is equal to one hundred eight dollars. Sir, the uh, JPY is dependent on the change in the USD. No, no, that's not the correct. That's not a correct statement. No, that's a, that's not a correct statement. What you just said, JPY is dependent on the changes. So the question is very simple. In this market, when we are looking at this market, are we uh, supposed to read this as there's something showing 108, 109 on the right on the axis, right hand axis? Okay, the the y axis. Okay. Now, so here this uh, the, the right hand axis. So now, is this supposed to mean one yen is equal to 108 dollars at this point, or is it uh, one dollar equal to 108? Yen. That's a simple. Okay. Okay. Fine. Okay. So yes, Mittal. What is your question? One zero eight. Yeah. Okay. So that's what it is, right? So because we know that in the currency markets, the convention is that uh, 
the base currency is shown first okay so from here you can figure out that dollar is the base currency and if dollar is the base currency then this has to mean that one dollar is never going to change okay and what is changing here on the on the price axis is actually the number of yen required to buy one dollar is everyone clear about this yes. so far okay all right so this is what uh, what we just want to have some practice here so if we want to go here look at another very important international market okay so this is interesting because gold is actually the international market for gold here we price it in terms of 10 grams and stuff but the international market for gold and the main market for gold is actually the global spot market for gold okay it's an OTC spot market and uh, this is as you can see here if we look at I haven't looked at this chart for a long time so uh, this gold market this is the main international market for gold although India is one of the biggest consumers of gold okay because we don't have free capital markets we don't have free capital capital flows etc okay the international gold market is not uh, it's ideally India should be a big player I mean it should be Bay I mean there should be a big trading center in Bombay etc but that doesn't happen because uh, we, we don't have free capital markets we don't have free uh, we don't have we have a lot of capital controls we don't have a freely convertible currency so therefore the big markets are all in the international markets where everything is free so this is a market that trades 24 into 5 all the way from Wellington to New York every day okay so here you see the international now this price is quoted in terms of dollars per troy ounce okay troy ounce is not the same ounce as you see in baking cakes if you see cake baking recipes there's ounce of flour and all that this troy ounce is actually not the same as that ounce it's a slightly different measure if you want you can just google it it's not important we don't need to remember these things like how many troy ounces is equal to one ounce and all that this you can always google later on okay but the main thing is you, are, you should understand that troy ounce is a different measure from ounce okay and you notice this about markets that every market has a different unit okay by convention this is just a matter of convention okay so so this is the international gold market so here what is the base asset in this market gold is the uh, is the base asset in this market and what is the terms asset US dollars okay so you should always say dollars uh, you should always say US dollars because uh, there could be other Canadian dollars okay other kind Australian dollar New Zealand dollar so you have to always say US dollars okay when you mean US dollars okay so yeah yeah use the use the mic one minute yeah go ahead we are now just practicing our understanding of base asset and terms asset by moving through different classes of markets yes so why is it noted gold slash USD yeah so this is a good question so this is just a quoting convention okay so it's only in the currency markets that you see that you have a clear guide which shows you that uh, you know we have both the currency shown and the base currency shown first okay in the other markets the quoting convention is such that we don't write it as uh, gold type gold slash USD although if you could you could also write it as gold the symbol for gold is uh, you remember the periodic table symbol for gold AU right so it is shown as XAU slash USD in certain quote machines okay so the quoting convention but in general you will not have uh, for the non-currency markets for the non-currency markets you will not have a clear statement about the terms currency so you have to figure that out base that's just basically contextual knowledge okay so you see in your notes on uh, base asset and terms asset you will see that uh, maybe I've not put that here uh, yeah it's here actually so this should um, so the terms currency remember that our definition of a market is an is a venue for exchanging two assets so there has to be there have to be always two assets in a market okay so it's just that it's in the non-currency markets the convention the quoting convention is such that we don't mention the terms currency but that doesn't mean that the terms currency doesn't exist okay it's always there okay so because in any market you're going to be exchanging two assets so two assets have to exist but if the quoting convention is such that they don't mention the terms currency in the other markets and non-currency markets okay is everyone clear the terms currency always exists you have to be able to figure it out okay so uh, now typically what will happen uh, yeah so we can discuss briefly about this the terms currency in cases where you don't know what's uh, like this is a global OTC market the gold market it's not really confined to any particular location so you have banks in Wellington dealing with banks in Hong Kong who are dealing with banks in Zurich who are dealing with people in London the major center for gold trading internationally 
is uh, for the spot gold market the OTC market is London okay so you'll see there's a London I've given you links to the London bullion market association so London is a major uh, bullion trading center so when we say bullion we include gold silver platinum palladium okay so you have massive stockpiles of gold uh, in London okay physical gold which is there in storehouses in London so this is where the at but but every time they trade they don't necessarily move all the physical they just move the the certificates right it's just your title to the gold ships okay kind of like in in, in Calcutta when they used to have jute trading it's a lot of the jute actually the jute didn't move but they would just give receipts and uh, say that okay now Hardik was the owner of that jute now that jute is now owned by Shreya because of a transaction but the jute actually doesn't move okay so uh, so anyway so London is the uh, is the major trader. Uh, major trading center for bullion okay so this is your uh, say so what, what else was I going to say here yeah okay so what you have as a general so the terms currency we know always exists okay so what is the rule for what is a rule for you guys to figure out what is the terms currency okay like suppose I've quote, uh, shown you something like this say Japan 225 which is a Japanese equity index okay if we see let me see if we have any other uh, yeah so if we have something like this or if I have even uh, so if I have let's say a stock price okay so if you know where that stock is listed okay the general rule for you because again in a stock price typically what will happen is they will not risk uh, they will not list the terms currency they, they will not show the terms asset they will only show the price of the stock okay so if you see uh, the price of any stock here let's see what is coming up here So you have the price of Microsoft's common stock which is coming up okay so we know that the price is what so it should be shown like this so the display is going to be the court display is going to be MSFT is 137.46 okay so in this case what is the base asset so the common shares of Microsoft okay the equity shares in India we would call it Indian equity shares in the US they would call it common stock of Microsoft so the uh, the base asset is the common stock of Microsoft okay the pricing unit is one okay although this is a question that Radhika was asking yesterday that uh, because I said that in India the market lot is one share okay but in the US the market lot is 100 shares okay but the price quotation is still on the basis of per share okay so if you go to trade in Microsoft you see that the price is 137.46 okay but when you buy one lot of Microsoft shares you still have to pay 137.46 into 100 okay so the price is quoted on a per share basis but the market lot is different so there are two different concepts the price quotation convention and the market lot convention two are two different things so you should not confuse them you should actually query those two things separately is that clear okay so you should be aware of the so these are matters of convention so these are not conceptual issues this is like you come to India if you're coming from the US you come to India and you find out okay here these guys drive on the left okay so this is just something you know so it's not a major conceptual issue it's just information it's just like it, it's just information okay so in this case if you are told that MSFT the base asset is uh, the common stock of Microsoft what is the terms asset US dollars okay it's US dollars because it's listed on the you can see this is a Nasdaq uh, listed stock okay the Nasdaq is a US based exchange so it is in this case it's US dollars okay so this is a safe uh, strategy in general there's an exception to this so the general safe strategy is you have to know where you are trading this particular base asset and so general rule is that it will be the local currency of that location okay but there are some exceptions to this which is for instance uh, so is this part clear to the general rule is clear to everyone even so the terms currency always exists even when it is not being shown in the quoting uh, in the quote display 
existence. Okay, it will always exist. It's mentioned there actually, in US order. Yeah, in this case it's mentioned, but it may not be mentioned. Okay, good. So you are observant. But in this case it's mentioned, but it's not it need not be mentioned. So even if it's not mentioned, you can use this rule to figure it out. That figure out where this thing is being traded. And as a general rule, it will be the local currency of that location. Okay. But there are some exceptions. So the general rule is clear to everybody. The exception is this. Okay. So I've given you all this stuff here. So basically you don't have to write anything. Your job is only to pay attention in the class and understand that you have not understood something and immediately raise your hand and ask a question. Okay. So the exceptions to this rule are. Uh, so I've given you the link to the if you want to learn about the international bullion market physical trading in uh, paper trading and physical trading as well you I've given you the links to the LBMA which is the London Bullion Market Association okay so now there are certain inter internationally traded markets right which is like gold and all etc are internationally traded markets so as I showed you this particular chart this price of gold this is the international market for gold now when gold is being traded in London okay normally you would expect that the terms asset should be British pounds because it's being traded in London okay but the general rule does not apply in the cases of internationally actively traded global markets where they're all traded against US dollars okay so gold so this is a little bit odd because gold trading in London is actually going to be traded in terms of US dollars to maintain the international convention is that clear to everyone so there are many ma such uh, markets like copper, gold, silver, platinum, palladium, all these markets. These are all internationally traded markets. So these are all traded in terms of even when you're trading oil, there's a lot, fair bit of physical oil trading also going on in London. So that also is happening in terms of US dollars. Because these are all global markets and because the US dollar is the most dominant currency in the world. Okay. And it will once again, let me remind you to study the US economy. The, you hear a lot of garbage about how the Chinese yuan is going to replace the US dollar. That is total garbage. Okay, it's not going to happen because the Chinese the Chinese economy has even tighter capital controls than India. The US doesn't have capital controls. Okay, so that's why it's the most liquid financial uh, capital market. All the people who have excess reserves, all the central banks who have excess reserves, even the Reserve Bank of India managing India's excess reserves. Where do we put them? A big chunk of it we put in gold. A big chunk we also put in US Treasury securities everybody goes into US Treasury securities because that is the most liquid safe asset in the world okay it's sovereign debt of the US so this notion that you hear that you know other currencies are going to replace the US dollar like the Russians and all are setting up a separate there's a total joke okay then nobody comes even close to having their uh, kind of liquid capital markets no other country even comes even the Europeans don't come close it's a massive market very deep and liquid market because of the size of the economy as well and because of the policies they follow so the US dollar will remain the dominant currency for even for your lifetime okay so okay so therefore these international markets are all traded in US dollar terms okay so you'll have when you trade gold in Hong Kong you'll be trading in US dollars okay when you trade gold in Zurich you're trading in US dollars okay everywhere okay so uh, so this is the point okay so are, are we learning some things now yes. you are able to understand your learning technical points make sure you revise all these things and internalize everything okay it's not very complicated stuff but uh, it's all new stuff okay and some of it is not uh, completely intuitive okay and obvious so because you're learning new stuff you have to revise it once or twice and make sure you finally understood it and then you can just file it away forever and you'll never forget it hopefully okay but if you don't do that initial revision it will not stay in your head okay so uh, so what we are learning is that the terms currency always exists okay which is the question that uh, Chug has led us to with his question okay so we go back to this part uh, we borrow this from the base uh, so, okay the second point we want to learn is is uh, okay we try to cover this um, okay this is still three o'clock okay all right so let's try and try, try and understand this is again not a very complicated matter okay uh, let's try and understand this okay so so far you understand market is a venue for exchanging two assets the base asset and the terms asset okay quoting conventions we have learned a little bit about quoting conventions so the other one other uh, the concept that we want to have is that every transaction in a market is a contract to exchange assets 
okay just like I have a contract with the furniture seller that I go I will pay you you know one lakh rupees you design the furniture for my living room you you make the furniture for my living room and deliver it that's a contract okay for it's a service plus product contract so similarly a transaction in a financial market we will see it as a we are already familiar with what a contract is okay so it's a contract to exchange assets because what's happening in a financial market there are two assets that are being exchanged okay so whenever we have a contract in a financial market we are going to see it as a whenever we have a transaction whenever we have a transaction in a financial market we are going to see it as a contract to exchange assets does that make sense it fits into your what you know so far because in a financial market what do we do we exchange assets so when we do a transaction in a financial market uh, we are going to do instead of seeing it directly as exchanging assets we will see it as a contract to exchange assets okay so the moment you enter into the contract you are obligated to perform the contract okay so we will see now slowly and so the other thing to understand is obviously because it's an exchange of assets whenever you're so the other thing that should be straight away drilled into your brain is whenever you're selling something you're buying the other so here if I sell gold what am I buying US dollars so now you have to think of so it's a little bit again counterintuitive because we usually only think that okay I've sold gold but now because I've told you that a, a market is a venue for exchanging assets there are always two assets so obviously and if there is a concept of exchange means one goes out and the other comes in so if you are selling something you have to be buying something okay just like it's like I go to this uh, if I go to the coffee shop and I buy coffee and I sell Indian rupees okay you have to think so it's a little bit odd to look at it this way but this is the right way to look at it because it will help you to understand the flow in every transaction okay now you have to see it as it's an exchange so whatever if you are buying here then you should be selling the other one okay so we say that okay so whatever you're if you are whatever you're doing to one asset the other thing uh, the other asset you're doing the opposite transaction opposite uh, action okay so I'm selling gold and buying US dollars this is clear okay and now if I let's say take uh, so if I take uh, oil and if I'm buying oil then I think the answer will come faster than uh, okay the chart load uh, so if I'm buying oil then what am I selling US, US dollars okay I'm buying oil and selling US dollars is everyone clear yes. every every market that's why I said every market you have to figure out what is the base asset what is the terms asset and what is the unit of trade okay that basic information you should whenever you see a market you should try to identify these few things okay so uh, whenever you and so the idea here is that because it's a contract every transaction is a contract to exchange assets so whatever you when you buy one you sell the other is this clear or sell one you buy the other okay uh, this uh, we have already discussed okay what else is here display convention I've already discussed with you guys okay so this you also have to be clear okay so this is again a matter of contextual this you'll figure out eventually okay that uh, so these things the other thing that you should know about these terms that we use okay INR SGD JPY these are known as SWIFT codes okay or sometimes also called currency code SWIFT is actually SWIFT stands for the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Transactions okay so you should be able to remember you can just google it later on okay SWIFT is an agency which handles all these international payments okay so it's a it's a payments network okay so kind of like if you think of our in India we have the NEFT RTGS payment network which connects RBI connects uh, connects RBI to all the other commercial banks yeah Mike, Mike is right in front of me. Yeah. So we are in the display convention. No, display convention I've done. Where do you see display convention? Yeah. We've done this, no? I told you that in FX price quotations, the base asset is always shown first. So we have done display convention, right? Yes, everyone is following. Gulati? Yes, sir. You're following on your mobile phone. Okay, okay. Okay. All right. So here hence JPY is the term that is you already discussed okay so far okay so this is again just a matter of conventional knowledge these are called swift codes this you should know okay so if somebody asks you what is the swift code for uh, Swiss franc maybe I've written it here 
or maybe it's somewhere else i didn't put it in chf okay so why is it chf like somebody might say why is it not swf okay so chf is because if you notice swiss consulate cars in delhi they will have ch okay ch is the name for official name of switzerland it's confederation helvetica that's the name for switzerland that's why it's confederation helvetica frank chf okay not a big deal it's just like a quiz trivia and question okay so swift codes these are called swift codes so generally uh, what we call generally the the rule is that most of the currencies are quoted against the us dollar okay and in, in most currencies the us dollar is the base currency but there are some exceptions okay like any exception that you know where major currency pair where us dollar is not the base currency can you see here Euro is a major cu currency pair. Euro, do Euro dollar FX is a major currency pair where Euro is the base currency, not US dollars. Yes. Then Sterling cable. This is called cable actually. It's already written in your notes. The name is cable, like in cable television. Okay. So uh, Sterling US dollar is referred to as the, that exchange rate is referred to as cable. Okay. Because this is because in the international in the old days when the British uh, when the when Britain was a very big major global power. The uh, exchange rate used to be sent, the closing exchange rate in London used to be sent by undersea cable to New York. So that's why this sterling dollar exchange rate came to be known as cable. Okay. So uh, anyway, so this is, uh, these are some cases where Aussie is another case where uh, US dollar, this is the quoting convention. Okay. So if you see Aussie here, okay. So this means, Puneet, this means one US dollar is equal to 70 Aussie cents. Is that correct? Yes. Vital, you agree with your friend? One US dollar is equal to 70 Australian cents. Aussie dollar. Okay. So he's correct. Okay. Because remember, what did we say base currency convention is base currency shown first okay so therefore it shows you that means this is one aussie by 70 us cents okay so this is so you have to remember this so when all this stuff you have to revise and internalize it so that now it just comes like that okay uh, so make sure you revise it until it, you can do it very easily all right so so there are some exceptions this is just a matter of convention okay but you need to know uh, so when you're you're training as a finance student it covers both types of knowledge both this is contextual knowledge just knowing that australian dollar is quoted in this manner okay aussie dollar us dollar exchange rate is quoted by in, according to this convention and that dollar yen is quoted into uh, according to with the us dollar the, these are all elements of contextual knowledge okay there is no concept involved in this this is just like information okay but you need to have both you need to have the information and you also need to have conceptual clarity this is clear okay all right so uh, we are covering all this we've we've covered all these terms as it always exists okay uh, exceptions to this rule okay so remember that we said that tra uh, car, uh, transaction every transaction in a financial market is a contract to exchange assets remember this okay a market is a venue for exchanging assets you have base asset and terms asset there are some conventions in every market which determine what is the base asset what is not okay so but then we said also that therefore transactions in a market in the financial market are contracts to exchange assets okay so contractual obligation you enter into a contractual obligation to sell something and, and to buy something else okay now what we say is therefore we also want to understand something else which is um, transaction dates versus settlement dates very important concept very simple concept nothing it's just that suppose I go to again I'll give you the example of the furniture shop okay if I go to my local furniture seller and I agree the terms and I say that okay these pieces of furniture in my living room you're going to make these and deliver it to my uh, house okay and I will pay you this amount of money so and maybe I pay a deposit or whatever but let's just take a simple example where he trusts me and we enter into a contract to uh, engage in this kind of exchange that I will pay him a fixed amount of money and he will deliver certain pieces of furniture to my living room okay 
and this delivery is going to happen let's say one month from now okay so today which is t0 okay so today is our uh, con uh, the transaction date okay where we have entered into so my obligation so after one month when he delivers the material i can no longer say no no i've changed my mind okay because i'm already contractually bound from t0 the day i've given him the order to make this stuff and deliver it to my house i'm already contractually bound okay but nothing is being exchanged on that t0 and let's say we have cash on delivery arrangement okay we have a cash on delivery arrangement so that i tell him that you deliver the stuff then i will pay you the cash okay just to make it simple i'm just uh, constructing this example so the transaction date is t0 when i give the order to him and he agrees that okay this, for this amount of money he is willing to deliver these pieces of furniture okay is that clear so that's the transaction date is t0 and one month later when he actually delivers the pieces of furniture and i pay him the cash that is what is called the settlement date okay a settlement date is the date on which the assets are actually exchanged okay so we also call it sometimes we also call it a value date all this stuff is written in your notes okay so essentially there's no need to worry about this at this stage okay and every uh, every uh, transaction will lead at least eventually to an exchange of assets okay because it's a contract every transaction is a contract to exchange assets okay this part italics part you forget about it's just meant to cover the case of options is this clear read this so everyone understands now we are defining two concepts transaction dates and settlement dates remember that your contractual obligation is already crystallized on the transaction date you cannot wake up on the settlement date even if it's 6 months later and say oh I'm sorry i've changed my mind you are already contractually bound from the transaction date is that clear so remember here you can recall all your contract law terms consensus addendum and all these things meeting of the minds you agree on all the terms okay all right okay uh, so the exchange occurs on the settlement date sometimes also called delivery date or value date okay so if you see here i've just made a we want to study everything from a uh, from a multidisciplinary perspective so we can uh, quickly flip here to the sale of goods act in india okay if you look at section 5.1 it actually takes care of this kind of a situation see what 5.1 say, says just read this italics part so once again you can revise your contract law terms there is an offer if you remember at the very beginning of the contracts module we discussed this section which is because the, this concept of offer and acceptance is not actually there explicitly in the indian contract act okay uh, they discuss it in parts but just to say that a contract is made by an offer and an acceptance that part is not there but you see it in the sale of goods act there is an offer that there is an acceptance okay so you can see that the contract so the contract becomes crystallized when you do this offer acceptance but the delivery can be either immediate okay it can be either immediate we can highlight this a little bit we can be have we can have either this or we can have installments or we can have postponement okay so if you take the extreme case of postponement this also brings out the idea that the transaction date and the settlement date are two different concepts okay that you enter into a contract but the the uh, exchange of assets which is the subject matter of the contract that ex actual physical exchange may happen at a later date it may also happen on the same date even if it happens on the same date we say that the transaction date and the settlement date are the same we don't say that there is no settlement date are you following yes so whenever so if the if the transaction date and the settlement date uh, if the exchange of assets happens on the same day if it's immediate exchange okay following the contract then we say that the transaction date and the settlement date are the same are you following 
see we have defined transaction date as the date on which you enter into the contract yes. and what is the contract it's a financial market contract so it's a contract to exchange assets okay that that defines the day on which you enter into the contract to exchange assets is your transaction date then you have a settlement date which is the date on which the actual exchange of assets will take place yes. now as you can see even in the sale of goods act it is possible that the exchange of assets will be immediate following the conclusion of the contract which means that the transaction date uh, which means that the, uh, the actual exchange of assets can happen on the same day as the day on which you finalize the contract all right but even in such a case we say that the transaction date and the settlement date happen to be the same we don't say that there is no settlement date are you following yes. so this discrete definition of a settlement date as the day on which the exchange of assets has to happen will uh, does happen is always uh, going to be present is that clear everyone's following okay so we have defined two new concepts transaction date and settlement date and that follows from the earlier definition of a transaction in a financial market as a contract to exchange assets and that is again connected to our earlier definition of a market as a venue for exchanging assets are you seeing how everything is connected yeah you're following that's why you need to understand the basics so that make sure that at each step you have understood what has been discussed because if you don't discuss that the later stages will create problems okay so market is a venue for exchanging assets we call them base asset and terms asset okay various conventions what is the base asset then a transaction in a financial market is a contract to exchange assets okay then we define two dates transaction date as the date on which you finalize the contract because remember some contracts can be as some settlement dates can be as far as 5 years 10 years 20 years forward you can have 20 year forward foreign exchange contracts okay which means you enter into the contract today at t0 the contract refers to an exchange of currencies which will happen 20 years later whatever you want to call it t1 or whatever but it's a settlement date so the settlement date can be 20 years later okay so uh, you have many long dated i mean uh, it's not the majority of the transactions are not so long dated but you have many long dated transactions like this okay so you can have very far away settlement dates which are very far away from the transaction date and you can also have them collapse together into one which is the same day transaction date and settlement date are falling on the same day okay but we still think of them as two separate uh, dates transaction date settlement date just happen to fall on the same day is that clear when the exchange is happen happening immediately as shown here in this section 5.1 okay so are you following now we are ready to jump to this uh, framework okay here yeah, this is this is already there in your notes so has everyone followed so far okay so therefore we will now jump to this framework which is uh, use, which we will keep referring to uh, maybe we should make it a little smaller okay now you can see everything it's actually you should have made it a little bit bigger the whole picture but anyway everyone can see okay so this is a framework where you can see uh, just try to understand obviously there are some limitations I wanted to do an Excel uh, do it in, in a spreadsheet uh, so there are certain drawing limitations if I did it freehand it would be much better but you can you should be able to figure out how to read this so you can see now Google Sheets allows you to turn around the arrows and all that you can actually tilt it around 45 degrees and all that so uh, these arrows now I put, put this arrow down here so these are the asset classes okay We'll figure out later what these terms mean, but first try to understand how to visually read this framework. Okay, so this is basically a matrix kind of structure. Okay, so you have uh, asset classes going down in the in this in the rows. Okay, in these asset these are the major asset classes. So we've defined five major asset classes. Okay, everyone can see that. It's a little dark, but you can still read. Anjum, can you read? You can't read. So are you making a general statement that you can't read or you're referring to this? You can't read real estate here. Why it's too dark. It's 
too dark or the font is too small? Font is small. Oh, light is creating a problem. Okay. So uh, just switch off the light here and see if you can read. But then there's a problem that if you switch off the light, I won't be able to see my. Uh, okay. So let's at least let's at least make sure that now can you read it? Okay. No, switch it back on. I need to see my keyboard. I'll call out. I'll call out. I need to see my keyboard. Okay. All right, guys. One sec. No, no. Just keep one. No, no, not that. You can switch out. I, I need this key. I need this light. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, all right. Okay, guys, I'll, I'll call out. Don't worry. I'll call out. Okay, so you see real estate, you see five major asset classes. Okay, we'll discuss all this stuff later. What is an asset class and all that. Okay, uh, then I've defined another category called instrument. Okay, so these are all types of instruments. Okay, again, you'll find out later what is exactly what what is an option, what is a forward. At this point, don't worry about the fact that you don't know what a swap is or what a forward is. At this point, you should just understand that, okay, what I mean by this framework is cash, spot, futures, forward, swaps, options are instruments and currencies, commodities, debt, uh, equities and uh, real estate are asset classes. Okay, so these are just terms. And then how do you read this? So here, what I'm trying to show, again, we have another type of definition, OTC markets versus exchange traded markets. If you see the long version of your notes on economies and markets, you'll see this distinction. Okay, so what I'm trying to show you here is that cash and spot markets, okay, cash markets are always OTC markets. Please pay attention, guys. Make sure you understand how to read this framework because we'll have to keep referring to it. And yes, what happened? There's some problem. Mike, Mike, I can't hear you. Okay, full form of OTC is over the counter markets. Okay, so that's all there in your notes. Okay, you can read it. OTC, full form of OTC is over the counter. Even uh, when you go to a pharmacy, you sometimes buy OTC drugs like all this, uh, you know, these uh, painkiller drugs that you have, typical of the paracetamol type of drugs. Okay. These are all called OTC drugs because you can buy them without, you can buy them over the counter without a prescription. Okay. So these are called OTC drugs. So the same meaning of OTC here, the same expansion and ET is exchange traded. ET means exchange traded markets. Okay. So what am I trying to show you here? What I'm trying to show you is cash markets are only OTC markets and spot markets can be OTC or they can be exchange traded. So try to read, uh, I'm just trying to explain what I'm trying to show you through this framework, how you should read this because it has certain limitations. Also what I'm showing you is futures are only exchange traded markets. This is what this means. Is everyone able to follow yes. what I'm showing here? Yes. And I mean, what what I intend to show through this kind of a frame, through the way that I've arranged it. Okay. What I what I mean by putting ET markets over here is that I'm trying to show that futures are only exchange traded markets, that forwards are only OTC markets. Okay. So some of this knowledge you can derive on your own from just by looking at the framework if you know how to read it. Okay. So what I'm showing you here also is that options have non-linear payoffs. Only options have non-linear payoffs and all the other instruments have linear payoffs. Now, what is a linear payoff that you don't know, but at least now you know that this much, this is like a first level knowledge. First, we have to identify all the categories and then we'll define them later. Okay. So you know that uh, these instruments have linear payoffs all the way from cash to swaps and only options have non-linear payoffs. And then you know that this futures, forwards, swaps and options, these are derivative markets, okay, or sometimes derivatives markets. And they, these are called cash and spot are underlying markets, okay. There are some exceptions where futures can also be uh, underlying markets and options can also be underlying markets, but we'll get to those later. But in general, this is the uh, setup, okay that uh, cash and spot markets are underlying markets and these are derivative markets. So these two terms are used together. Derivative markets will always refer to some underlying market. Okay. So now everybody understand how to read this framework. Okay. And what we are going to do is like what I was showing you just now. Remember I was showing you the gold market. Okay. So when you see what is the objective of this kind of a framework, the objective is 
because there are so many markets in the world okay and so many different types of instruments you get very confused okay if when you encounter these so this is meant to help you get some sense of perspective by having a framework into which you can put you can put different markets and instruments into certain boxes okay and that's how you make and help you to make sense of the whole uh, markets landscape because the landscape is quite vast okay when you look at the landscape of markets is quite vast okay so for instance when you look at the gold market here as i told you this is an otc spot gold market okay the international market for gold where would you put this here in the framework is gold a currency it's a commodity right it's not equity it's not debt it's not real estate gold is a commodity okay so gold is a commodity and i told you this is the otc spot market for gold so this goes here okay so there is also a fairly developing market in coal coal also you can put your coal as a commodity and there is a spot market for coal so that's a commodity that goes into uh, this box okay so it's at the crossing of commodities and spot are you able to follow what's going on here yes. in this framework okay so so here for instance you can see here already what i mean by why is this framework called asset classes markets and instruments okay because asset classes and instruments you already understand what I, i mean you don't understand what the instruments are but you know what i'm referring to as instruments right okay so uh, so this framework is all asset classes markets and instruments why you can you can't see markets anywhere you see only asset classes and instruments okay but here are the markets okay so in this box i can also put steel okay if i just put steel for the sake of argument now there is a spot market in steel also okay now so here what you here you understand what is meant by why this framework is called asset classes markets and instrument okay so spot is a type of instrument it's really it's like a type of contract okay so here and and this is not an exhaustive list okay this is obviously i'm limited by space i want to make sure that people can read the stuff so i can't so you can imagine this little box in which i have where my cursor is you can imagine that you really blow it up and make it a huge box where i can write down all the global spot market all the spot markets and commodities okay like copper everything else okay here oil copper everything is all the commodities spot markets you can think of imagine that this cursor where this is cell number d d uh, 13 cell number d 13 is blown up and made into a huge uh, cell in which i can type in all the uh, spot commodity markets oil copper zinc aluminum everything i can think of okay yeah yeah all agro commodities wheat lumber i mean wheat uh, rice okay um, corn okay all those things okay everything you can think of so try to understand how this framework is to be mentally used i mean uh, how how this can be useful to you so what do i mean by the markets part of the framework asset classes and instruments you know what i'm referring to as asset classes and instruments now where do the markets come in this is where the markets come in at the intersection of the asset class and the instrument at the intersection of those are the markets so imagine here for the sake of because there is not enough space here i can only write three markets gold coal and steel but imagine that this cell was massive and i could write all the spot commodity markets in the world like she said wheat rice everything okay corn soybeans okay soybean has split into uh, so soy you have three markets you have soybeans that soybeans you crush the soybeans and you can make it into soybean meal and soybean oil so you have separate commodity markets for those also you have three markets actually in soybeans okay so all of those markets imagine that this is a massive cell and uh, i can type in all the commodity spot markets in the world into that cell okay that's how this framework should be visualized okay that at the intersection of uh, asset class and instrument lie all in, in at that intersection you have to visualize all the possible markets that could exist are you following will play back you can play back this video and try to understand this it's important to understand this framework it will help you because it will help you to make sense of all the different markets and instruments that exist in the world otherwise it gets very confusing okay so the framework will help you to make sense of it
Is everyone convinced? Yes. Are you able? Are you able to follow at least what we're trying to say here? This is how you have to visualize it. Think of this as at the intersection of markets and instruments. You have a massive cell which includes all the possible markets in that. And remember how we've defined markets. Gold again is a market for exchanging gold against US dollars. Coal will be the coal market is where you exchange coal against US dollars. Okay, against steel against US dollars or whatever. Sometimes coal and steel are not so global. So you can have local markets also. Okay. So, uh, but whatever the local market is, in that case, it's against the local currency. But we can think of them as global markets. So, the when I say markets here, we have three markets as an example. Okay, I've only been able to write three markets because of space limitations. Okay, so we have three markets here where the base asset in the first one is gold and US dollars, second one is coal and US dollars, and the third one is steel and US dollars. Each of them becomes a market because it's a venue for exchanging these two assets. So, you see how we remain true to our original definitions okay so you'll find that these definitions never change anywhere so the whole framework is consistent throughout okay are you following yes. so this is what we mean by markets and markets you've already covered a venue for exchanging two assets okay so this is what we mean by asset classes markets and instruments okay why this framework is called that so similarly if i go into the spot currency market Okay, 24 by 5, it trades from Wellington to New York, 24 by 5. You see all these currencies. So think of this box, in this box, you put in all the possible combinations. You can see only few here. You can see this one, this one, this one, this one here. Then you have this, 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 this. All put in all of those currencies and even this doesn't include everything. Okay, I think we stop. You can see all the possible combinations. Can you see them? Sterling Yen, Swiss Yen, Canada Yen, Aussie Yen, Aussie CAD, Kiwi Dollar, Dollar Sing Singapore Dollar, Euro Yen, Euro Sterling. Okay, all these Dollar Canada, Dollar Swiss, Euro Sterling here again. So I take all these currency combinations and many more which are not shown here. And I take each of them and I put a comma and I keep on writing Euro USD, comma, USD CHF, comma, this, this into this small box here okay and if i write down all the possible combinations okay that shows you all these n number of currency markets are you able to follow how the framework should be used so you have the intersection of currencies as an asset class and all of these are trading mainly on a spot basis they trade on other terms also other instruments as well but they all trade on mainly the main global markets for currencies as main market is on a spot basis Okay. Uh, using spot as an instrument type okay so are you following now what I mean by asset classes markets and instruments okay you have to visualize the markets because the cells obviously here are big enough for me to write all the markets you have to visualize it is that clear okay all right so we have this uh, where is Japan this one yeah. Okay, that's the uh, most famous equity index in Japan. Uh, that's an index of 225 stocks. Uh, it's called the Nikkei 225. You might have seen in certain, if you are following uh, uh, global markets news, you see they will report on what the Nikkei is doing. Okay. So this is the Japanese equity index, this is like the Nifty 50 in Japan. Okay. All right. The, or the Sensex in Japan. All right. So everybody knows what an equity index is. Yes. Okay. An index is just, I don't think everybody knows clearly, but an index is just an average. Okay. So instead of uh, individually looking at everybody's grades in this class, if I just take an average grade for the whole batch, because I don't have time to look at everybody's grades, I take an average grade for the whole batch. The index is the same concept. Instead of looking at all the 225 stocks in the Nikkei average, I just take an average of those 225 stocks. Okay, an average you can, as you know from your trading and maths, average can be either an unweighted average or a weighted average. Okay, unweighted average is essentially just an equal weighted average. Okay, and sometimes you can weight the averages through market cap and all that. Okay, so the Nikkei 225 is an unweighted average. Okay, that's just a matter of how they've been calculating it. Okay, so whereas there's another index in Japan called the Topics, which is a weighted average, it is weighted by by market capitalization so it's not equally weighted okay more ma higher market cap stocks have higher weight 
in the index okay so index you can calculate the as you know with any average you can calculate in multiple ways you can have equally weighted or you can have weighted by some other way so similarly so index is just an average that's all it is okay any index is just an average of all the components in there okay and you have yeah Nifty 50 is a market cap weighted average. Okay, so Sensex, if I'm not mistaken, Sensex is an unweighted average. Okay, Sensex is I think 30 stocks. It's an unweighted average. Okay, so this is just a matter of but the Nikkei is considered to be more important uh, in terms of uh, you know as being a market leading indicator, that more important than the topics. Okay, which is actually the weighted average. Okay. So uh, we just learned a little bit about indices. Okay, so you can see this. So where would you put Japan 225 here, guys? Just since we are there, where would you put it? Which row? Equities. Equities. Okay. So here we would put them. Most of these are uh, quoted on a spot basis. So we would find this is just a matter of conventional knowing the convention. So you would put all the global equity markets. Okay, in, including indices would be here. Okay. So even if you are looking at stock of Toyota. Toyota Motor Corporation. Okay, if you look at the stock of Toyota Motor Corporation, again that will go into this box because the most of the stock markets will be trading on a spot basis, and uh, a common stock of Toyota Motor is not a commodity, it's not a currency, it is not debt, it is equities. Okay, so uh, that's why I said here single stocks and indices. So it's clear. This is how you use the framework. Okay, now uh, let's look at something else here. In this framework where did we come to this okay so remember we studied about uh, settlement dates and uh, transaction dates and settlement dates okay so uh, transaction dates and settlement dates one of the ways in which uh, that information is useful is one more thing you have to notice about this framework T here the settlement you see the settlement here maybe I should put settlement date So what is it? Remember, we discussed a situation where you could have the transaction date and the settlement date on the same day. Okay. So those transactions are known as transactions value cash or cash transactions. Cash transaction, not in the sense of cash on delivery when it comes from Amazon. No, but these are called value cash. To make it very specific, you should say transactions value cash. Okay. Value cash is all written in your notes, but anyway, you can write it down. It maybe help you to internalize stuff. So transactions uh, where the transaction date and the settlement date are on the same day, those are called transactions value cash. Okay. So that's why we've given, uh, because that's the nature of the contract. So the nature of the contract defines the instrument. So that's why we are calling them uh, cash instruments. Okay. Where instruments which are trading value cash. Okay. So similarly here. So what I've tried to show, how are you supposed to read this? This particular row is referring to the settlement dates. Okay. For each type of transaction or each type of instrument. So what we are saying is settlement date for cash transactions is T plus zero where T you can read this. The T is the transaction date. So T plus zero means the same as the transaction date. So this is what is meant by uh, the statement that a transaction done for value cash is one in which the transaction date and the settlement date are the same. Okay. So spot typically. So one of the ways in which we are distinguishing between these uh, instruments, there are other ways to distinguish. One of the ways in which we are discussing distinguishing is that the uh, typical settlement dates will differ from each of for each of these instruments. So in spot, typically it is T plus two. Okay, sometimes it is T plus three, the settlement date. Okay, and for forwards and futures, although I've given just greater than T plus two plus two or three. Okay, but usually it is much much greater than two uh, spot. Usually for forwards and futures, especially for forwards, it can be much greater than uh, uh, so and so so also for futures. So it is much greater than T plus two or three. That's why I've said greater. Are you able to follow this notation? Yes. So what I mean to say here is that the settlement date for futures and forwards is uh, much greater than T plus two or three, so which is greater than spot. So it will be further out than spot. Okay. All right. So similarly, these are uh, given as just greater than T plus zero, uh, but technically, uh, but usually they are much longer, much further out. Okay. So people are getting restless. So maybe we should check the time. Oh, it's only four, we have five minutes left. 
Yes. You want for yours too? I one minute, one minute. Let's say one sec, guys. Let's let's try and understand stuff. Okay, let's try and complete material. Okay. All right. So, are you able to follow this framework? So, here what I've tried to do is give you an idea as to how to use uh, this framework. So, when you come across an instrument like a uh, let's say a swaption, okay, if you if you read that book, Risk Management Solutions, which I showed you, you'll find a reference to swaptions. What are swaptions? Swaptions are options on swaps. Okay. So, essentially, these are options related to. Uh, that's why I said swaps can also be uh, normally we have not listed swaps as a underlying market But in certain types of instruments they can be these can also be underlying markets. Okay, so maybe I should put a slightly lower uh, Lighter shade of this in, in over here, but uh, anyway, so swaptions are options on swaps So you would put them in swaps relate to uh, Dead instruments. So this would go into this this particular box at the intersection of options and uh, debt okay so this is how you're supposed to read this framework all right so you can study this framework a little bit more on your own you should to get an understanding of this uh, situation of, of, of global markets okay uh, so we can see the differences between various this is all I've already discussed this you can just read this is for more material over here okay um, okay so just one point I'll discuss with you guys before we get into this uh, and and so this uh, this is one thing that you have to understand which is the this all the stuff that we already discussed okay there's some material on individual instruments you can look at that on your own and study it on your own okay but we already discussed uh, all the broadly we've discussed the instruments you can read up on this material and see if there's any um, uh, any uh, anything that you want to highlight later on okay so one thing we want to study is this concept of settlement risk before we go into this uh, element settlement risk okay what do we mean by settlement risk settlement risk is that suppose this guy delivers the uh, I will giving you the example of the furniture uh, transaction okay now suppose I've uh, arranged with this guy to deliver the uh, furniture to my living room and uh, I would pay him some money so suppose he sends his delivery guys and they deliver the material okay so once the material is in my house it's like under my control so what if I tell him that okay I'm not going to pay you the money okay so that is an example of what we call settlement risk settlement risk essentially is the risk that your counterparty in this case I am the furniture sellers counterparty and the furniture seller is my counterparty in the transaction okay so the settlement the concept of settlement risk is the risk that the your counterparty is not going to fulfill his contractual obligation to deliver the asset that he's supposed to deliver remember you're delivering one asset and he's delivering one asset because you're selling something and he's also selling something and you're buying that okay so essentially settlement risk is the risk that one party will not perform their contractual obligations and not deliver the asset as as agreed okay so this is this can be a very significant risk as I've given you here okay is a case where there's a German bank called Herstat which went so in the case of currency transactions remember if we are doing currency transactions what is happening is that uh, you have uh, one currency is being exchanged for the other okay so you had a German bank called Herstat which had many currency transactions maturing on a particular day okay and on that day in the morning in the early morning of that day uh, that bank opened in Germany and the regulators declared it bankrupt okay so if it's bankrupt that means it doesn't have to fulfill its obligations okay so whatever settlement instructions that particular bank was supposed to send out that day okay all that <coughs> didn't go out okay so whatever monies they were supposed to pay to people on that day that money never got paid but those counterparties of her Stat bank they had already taken care like people in New Zealand and all because they close early okay so if they had so before closing they would have sent their instructions to the New York office to pay dollars to her Stat bank but her Stat bank maybe has to pay Canadian dollars to these New York New Zealand bankers okay but they would not have given their corresponding instruction so it's like I release the payment from my side assuming that you will also release the payment from your side at the same a little bit later but you don't release the payment but by then my payment is already gone so I can't take it back okay so what happened is a lot of other banking counterparties of Herstat Bank who had already made their payments for that day 
they were all uh, caught by surprise and their payments went out and once it goes out what happens in a bankruptcy is the liquidator hangs on to it if i'm the liquidator of hostad bank i'll say okay you paid the money too bad this is now my money i'm not giving it out okay so then you have to like sue the liquidator and all that so it's quite complicated so essentially this is the problem that so this is why we have to worry in international markets when we trade we have to worry about this concept of settlement risk so you have to worry about this risk that the other guy may not pay up okay so this is something to be aware of so you should understand this concept this concept of settlement risk it basically means that uh, the other guy may not pay up okay so we will continue this discussion now we are almost ready to go into why did we have to have this discussion about the asset classes markets and fra- uh, why did we have to discuss this framework because when we go to decision problems the first three decision problems relate to asset class market and instruments and your fourth decision problem by or sell that's where valuation comes in okay so we will discuss valuation so please don't get scared those who are dec- deciding to leave finance because of the fear of project finance and valuation please hold off for one more day but our next class is not till next week okay so anyway uh, don't get scared